What is like the most contraband you found in, in someone? <laughs> um, the spiritual leader turns around and looks, and as he makes eye contact with the guy who's holding his hand in this gun shape, the guy just shouts, "Bah!" <laughs> We've got a female prison, and they took a big sort of um, block of green soap. It's one very long block. You know, it's, it's, I think it's about half a meter. I th I'll, I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. Was it one or many dildo? No, it was one. <laughs> is, is, that, is that the plural for... for... Cluster of <laughs> yeah. What's up, everyone? And welcome to the Wide Awake Podcast. Are you ready? Today, I have a guest that I've been wanting to speak to for a while. You know, I've interviewed many gangsters on this podcast, and I've always been interested in speaking to a Paulsmore prison warden. And today... He is in the studio. So today my guest is Kieron Reddy. Yep. <laughs> he is a warden at one of the most notorious prisons in the world. Yeah, that's Paul, right. Paulsmore Prison. Walls designed to keep dangerous inmates out of sight, also hiding allegations of abuse, disease outbreaks, severe overcrowding. But Paulsmore is also home to one of South Africa's most feared and brutal fraternities, the Numbers Gangs. So what would happen if the 27s didn't follow your orders? I killed them. Built for 3,000 men, it now houses nearly 7,000. Welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here with you, Josh. And yeah, it's good to... Looking forward to having a chat with you. Can you tell us a little bit about Paulsmoor and the reputation it has? Yeah, so, so Paulsmoor is a very old prison. You know, it's one of the oldest prisons in, in, in South Africa and ultimately in the world as well. Um... It's it's it has a notorious reputation, and today it's it's not one big prison. It's five prisons within a big management area. Most of the people that that are incarcerated in Portsmouth come from these gang-ridden areas, and of course, within the prison system, South Africans will know this, but perhaps some of our international you know viewers might not. But in our prisons, we have three gangs who sort of dominate in the prison culture, more so in the Western Cape. If you travel to parts Further up north in South Africa, you might find that there are two other gangs that are found in prisons. Um, but here in the Western Cape, there are only three that's found in prisons. And that's obviously where the, the notorious connotation, you know, comes when it comes to Portsmouth. And what are those three gangs? So they, they would be the 26 gang, the 27 gang, and the 28 gang. Um, we have a term for them. Um, most of the terminology that we use for gangs, it's all Afrikaans-based. Um, in Afrikaans, we would call them the Drikamp, and it literally means the three camps. So we'll refer to each of those gangs as a camp, you know, and that's why together the three of them become the Drikamp. And are you allowed to talk about kind of the different roles each gang plays? Well, I think, I think you know, for us as South Africans, by now I think it's, it's almost common knowledge when it comes to sort of gang culture, gang nomenclature. Um, that the 26s are always associated with money, the 27s are sort of associated with blood or violence, and the 28s are sort of, if you want to see it as the governing gang for the three camps. Yeah. And who are the leaders currently uh, of the Numbers Gang within Pozmo Prison? So be because of the size of Pozmo and because of just the nature of it, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint and say, you are the leader for the entire camp of 28. Within a cell, within one cell, there could be possibly 40 to 45 people. And in that cell, it will be easy to identify who the leaders are in that cell. But to, to pinpoint and say specifically, this is the leader for the 28th at Paulsmoor, um, it's difficult to do that because I think, as, as you would know, within that gang culture, they have a ranking system. Much like how we as wardens have a ranking system. Uh, these ranks would come from you know, it, it stems from a sort of pseudo-military kind of build-up. So you would have someone who's a colonel and he would have a sort of a regiment fall under him. It's similar to that, um, where you have ranks. And so in a, in a room where there are 45 prisoners and let's say about 25 of them are 28s, it will be easy to identify who the leader is there. Uh, but he might not necessarily be the entire leader of Paulsmo. If that, if that makes sense. hundred yeah. percent, yeah. And the way the prison is broken up, is it done on purpose so that the inmates can't form like one main leader? You know what I mean? They're kind of kept very separate in a way. So we've got a process where we call unit management. 
It's unit management. Um, the whole point of unit management is is really to protect the vulnerable, if I can put it like that. Because when someone, and perhaps it, it will help to, to begin with when someone arrives in prison, when someone is arrested in the community for committing an alleged crime, you know, you are put in a court of law, you put before a judge, you might get bail, you might not get bail, depends on when they hear your case. You come to Paulsmore and you are admitted. You, your fingerprints are taken, you're given a prison number, you're given a, a prison ID card, um, with your prison number on there and your alleged felony with your name and your surname. And then you get kept in a holding cell and the next day you'll be distributed to what we call the units, where the actual housing units are. And upon your arrival, um, I as the warden working on that section would ask you who you are, I'd ask you to produce your ID, I'd see what you're in for and then I'd begin to ask you a series of questions because I have to profile you. I've got to know who you are, I've got to know a little bit about you. And at some point, there will be a search as well and a visual inspection of the naked body because I need to see your tattoos as well because your tattoos will tell me a lot about you without you even having to say anything to me. And that's where it's important. And that's why within the number system, you know, people mark themselves with the camp that they belong to. And it makes it very easy for us then to know who's who because with the ranking system, it's able to see, okay, so you've got that tattoo there that tells me a little bit about you. You've got these abbreviations on you. Now I know if you have an outside gang and it's really helpful. And so if I see you and you've got nothing at all, it's your first time in prison, then my job is to make sure that I can put you in a place for non-gangsters because you're vulnerable. It's your first time here, irrespective of the alleged crime that you've committed. You know, I still have a duty to protect you to, to some extent and put you in a place where you're not going to be targeted, bullied or victimized. Um, and so when it comes to the unit management, the aim of unit man management isn't to spite or just separate for the sake of doing it, but it's it's to ensure that there's a balance, if, the, if that makes sense. And does that actually happen though? Because I mean, I've heard some horror stories of people going into Pozmo prison and other prisons around the country and they're not gangsters and they're there for like petty crimes. Um, and then there, you obviously know what the gangs do to new members or even existing members they take them as vafies which is like a a wife um and abuse them um and many other things as well i mean does that actually happen is that is that consistent thing that happens that if someone is seen as not an affiliate of the gang you guys put them somewhere else if they don't have any of the markings that they are taken separate and that are people that are there for like petty crimes placed in the same place as like a murderer yeah, so we try our level best to make sure that that doesn't happen. Nobody, no court of law sends any individual to any prison to go there and be sexually abused, to be used and to be exploited. No court of law does that. And from my understanding, because I'm still relatively new and young, I've only been there for 10 years, uh, my understanding is that that has taken place previously. I think, you know, we had incidents like the Jali Commission and things of that nature where that sort of stories came out, where that sort of things were exposed. What I can say is that our, our, our unit standard manuals, you know, what we get taught, how we get trained, is that we are to avoid that by all means. And it's not just people that are new in prison. It's people that are elderly. It's people that are foreign nationals as well. You know, it's people, it's people that there's a category of, of just vulnerable people that need to be separated and not put in a space where they're going to be exploited and abused. Um, we take that very seriously. You know, I work in a, with a great team of people. Um, on, on our particular unit and our section, we've got anything between 160 to 100 and in, 170 inmates at any given time. And it, it's very relational. And so we make sure that, that by all means, we try our best to protect and to keep balance because we don't want situations where you know, people are being abused, where people are being exploited. But it obviously does happen. We create an environment where somebody who has been perhaps abused or even feels like they might potentially be abused to raise his hand and say, you know, sir, they call us chief for the most part. I don't feel safe. And this is why. And our job is then to give that person the necessary attention um, that is needed because there are systems in place that allow you know, for the vulnerable and the weak, if I can use that term, and I use it with respect, um, to be assisted. 
That's good to know because I've always wondered like if if that's how it takes place with with my experience with law enforcement um I've had a pretty positive one um which is kind of not what people usually report when having interactions with law enforcement um but I've always been treated with care even when I got into trouble um so it's good to know because I think the conception or the the perception of Paul's more and wardens and prisons around South Africa is that they're just ruthlessly led and that people do not care about the prisoners. But I can see that obviously someone like you has a lot of compassion and I can, I can see in the way you speak about people that that is not the case. I'm sure it is the case sometimes, yeah. but um, it, it's good to know this, <laughs> especially yeah. if I ever get in it's, trouble. <laughs> it's, it's reassuring, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, talking about uh, the gangs, um, one of the most notorious leaders that was obviously featured in a Ross Kemp yeah. interview uh, was John Mongrel. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about him? He was in Paul's Mill Prison. My, that's my understanding. So that was way before my time. I think when when that interview was done with Ross Kemp, I think I was in grade 11. I think that was uh, <laughs> 2006. I'm giving away my age. Um, but yeah, that was 2006. And... I feel like, you know, when I watched that documentary, because at the time, I think we all watched it. And I think we all watched it. We were, we were sort of gripped and glued to it. And we couldn't believe, you know, this is this is the world of prison. You know, if that didn't if that didn't scare you and convince you that this place is not for me, then I don't know what would. But now when I watch it now with, if I can say, you know, I think at the time I watched it, I felt like I was uninitiated. And now I watch it with an initiated mind and initiated eyes. I think that portrayal of Paul's Moore couldn't be further from the reality and couldn't be further from the truth. I must say that, of course, things do happen. Things take place there. Of course, we know that, you know. But I think that that was, uh, it was just, the way it was, was portrayed is that this is just this lawless society, this lawless world where things just happen and it's just the norm and we accept it. And there's violence every single day. There's people that get raped every day and there's murders every day. And that couldn't be further from the truth. As far as John Mongrel is concerned, you know, I'm glad I, I wasn't there at the time because it seems like, like prison has become somewhat more, I don't want to say it was re it's relaxed, but it's not as violent as it once was. And, and there are a number of reasons for that as well. Um, but during the John Mongrel era, it seemed like, yeah, possibly that sort of thing still still happened. Maybe not on the, on the big scale as was portrayed in that documentary. But um, yeah, what a s scary portrayal of someone. I didn't know him personally. I'm very glad for that, and I understand that you know he he passed away sometime, some some years after that interview. Um, but yeah, yeah. And what did the documentary get wrong? Because knowing like gang culture and that kind of stuff, there was quite a lot that I saw that I was like, this doesn't look like it's being over dramatized. A lot of a lot of the okay. stuff. Um, what do you think it got wrong? I think just in particularly, if I can touch again on that interview with John Mongrel, where he just said that if people don't do what he wants them to do, that he kills them. I think I think that they got horribly, horribly wrong. Or maybe he maybe why he said that, I don't I don't know. Because my understanding is that within within the number gang, that one man can't just decide that we're going to kill you. You know, when it comes to a murder that takes place, um, which again is not normal. I have to I have to stress that, and doesn't just happen on a daily basis. There there have been there have been times you know where for for years you know no one was murdered by the gang. Nobody who's in the gang was murdered by the gang. You know. And so I felt like they got that wrong. Just this portrayal that if people don't do what he wants them to do, that he just kills them, that he just takes this this, uh, this executive decision just to execute people as he wills. You know, I think that that was... The, again, that's his own admission, but that isn't the reality, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Um, and what are the conditions like inside of the prison? So the conditions at one point was not exactly what we would call your mother's house. Um, and, and that's a saying, by the way, you know, in, in prison, they always say, and I think, I think um, it, was, it was said in one of these movies, um, I think the movie's name was The Forgiven, where it was actually, yeah, it was, it was filmed at Paulsma actually. 
And it was said that, and I'll say it in Afrikaans and I'll translate it for our international audience. Tronk is your mother's um, prison is not your mother's house because in your mother's house there's a certain way that things are done there's a certain comfort there's a certain level of enjoyment and relaxation that exists at your mother's house but you won't find that in prison and there was um, a sort of like a turning point where an organization took the department as a whole to court and won their case um, I think it was Sisonke Gender Justice and you know the, the conditions has improved for the better. But even prior to that, you know, us South Africans, you know, you, you can't ignore that during the apartheid years, it was even much worse. And, you know, even if you read Nelson Mandela's book, you know, he talks about how conditions over the years, because he had a number of years in prison, how it improved over the years. And I would say it, it definitely has gotten, it had definitely has gotten better. And I read that Paulsmo is meant to hold roughly 4,000 prisoners, I think. Is that correct? I think it, I think that original figure was a little bit less than that. I think it was a little bit less than that, yeah. I read currently, I don't know when this was written, but currently, according to what I read, said there's 7,000 prisoners. I think that's an accurate number. I, th I, think, I think that is an accurate number. So there's, is, is the prison way too overcrowded? It, I recall when I began there, it definitely felt like it was a lot, it was hectically overcrowded. It felt that way. Um, now at the moment, there's a lot less people in prison. And I think that has something to do with the courts of law uh, issuing more community-based sentences. So instead of saying, Josh, you've committed a crime, we're going to send you to Polsmo for three months because that would be considered a petty crime. We say, Josh, we're going to ask you to do community service. That's going to be your you know, your payment back for what you've taken from the community. So instead of sending you to prison for three months, we're going to say, this is what you're going to do. You're going to serve in the community mm. that you've wronged. And so so, so, so they're not really for like light sentences for, you know, petty crimes. They're not just sending people, I think, like, like they previously have, yeah. But you say there's still way too many people. It's still overcrowded. For the, for the number that it was built for, I think so. So if I can just give you an illustration of of how they get to that sort of number, it's built for this amount of people, but we have, when you build a room and you say this room has a capacity for 20 people, this is an example that I'm giving you now, 20 people, and so there'll be 20 beds in that room, single beds. Now we decide we're going to make them double bunks. So the, the amount increases from 20 to 40. to 40. And that's how we say, well, this room is now overcrowded because it was built for 20, but we've now got 40. So that's how the, the overcrowded percentage goes up. It's like when you get in an elevator and it says this ele elevator is for 11 people, but you're like, I know we can fit 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and I'm thinking, no, it's, it's fit, fit for 12 people. That's maybe six of me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like mm, 13 yeah. of me. That's the capacity. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm sure during your time there, you've had some shocking experiences as well. Yeah. Um, has there, can you tell us a few stories of things that have really taken you back and uh, shocked you? There were, there were two incidents I think that stand out where where colleagues of mine were stabbed. And I remember both vividly. Um, the one happened not in my presence. I, I had been asked to go and collect an inmate that was at an outside hospital. I went, it was a Sunday morning. And and just on a side note, whenever stabbings take place in in prison, it always tends to be on a Sunday. It always tends to be on a Sunday. And there's significance for that. Um, significance, I won't go into it uh, completely, but it is with, within the number. Um, Sunday tends to be the day when that sort of thing happens. And what had happened was I was asked to go and collect an email at the hospital, which I did. And as I came back, I had to, so when he came back from the outside hospital, I had to take him to the internal hospital, our prison hospital, for his medication to be you know, captured and, and distributed for him. And I was there for some time. And what had happened was the night before, an inmate, an elderly inmate, had passed away from natural causes. Um, he was a bit ill and he was being kept at the hospital section so he could be monitored. And he had passed away. And so the prison doctor was called because he has to declare him, you know, deceased. And there's a whole lot of paperwork that he has to fill out as the prison doctor. And while I was busy with my inmate, I was told to go and get his medical file. And I went to go and look for the file. It took me some time to locate it because there were just so many files there. And as I came back made my way from the 
the hospital administration office back to the sort of consultation area at the hospital, I noticed there was a trail of blood on these sort of, um, it's like these outdoor sort of tiles. It's not like an, it's not like inside. It's like the kind of tiles you'd find on a porch. Mm. And I noticed there was a trail of blood. And I thought, oh man, you know, who assaulted who now? And as I came into that sort of consultation room, it was my colleague. He was bleeding. He had just been stabbed. He had just been stabbed. It was the 16th of June, 2018. I'll never forget it. Um, because just a month before that I had gotten married. So the dates are still very fresh in my mind. Mm. And he was stabbed in the back. I, the circumstances surrounding his stabbing were unclear to me at the time. Um, but yeah, he, he had been stabbed. and Because I asked him what happened. And then he just said, they stabbed me. And he, I could see he was in a lot of pain. And, and you know, I also believe that all things sort of just, even, even in calamity, even in... In, in chaos, there's still some form of order. There's still something high. There's a, there's a higher power, you know, orchestrating things in the back. Well, that's my personal belief. Because, because that inmate had passed away the previous night, that doctor was still sitting in the room next door. And that warden had just been stabbed. And the doctor was right there on hand. And he was able to just, you know, attend to him, stitch him up. And he, the doctor said, while he, he looked at it, he said, he's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. But he does need to get to a hospital. And it was a long day. It was a very long day because we had to go back to that section where he had been stabbed. That's such an amazing coincidence that the doctor was there. Exactly. And, and you know, I thought about it because in the wake of everything that had happened, I thought, wow, doctor was here. He was able to treat him immediately because he was busy doing the paperwork that needed to be filled out for that inmate that had passed away. And, you know, when a stabbing happens, the first thing is to take out anybody who's been injured and then to deal with the people that remain behind there. And you try and and then you search, you look for the weapons, you try and establish what has happened here, why has this happened? You know, and then and then and and you know it attracts a lot of attention as well. And then other role players, our task force comes and other people come to visit and you know it creates a, just a, a a massive hoo-ha, as it were. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was the one incident um that stands out for me. And it, yeah. The second incident, that was a lot closer to home. Um, and I don't really talk about this, you know, my, my, I, I didn't even share this one with my wife. Um, this one happened in, in 2020, the 31st of May, 2020. Um, and this, this, this stabbing took place again on a Sunday. Um, the overall mood at the time, it didn't, it wasn't cause for alarm. You know, it wasn't as if there was this, just this hectic tension that we all felt. And everybody said, hey, did you notice that? Did you notice this? It was nothing around around that. Um, what had happened was an inmate that, yeah, for the most part, he was a, he was a decent-ish kind of guy. Well, when I say decent, I mean on our observ observation. Mm. We always say... On no, a human level. Yeah. Like, no, obviously, we, they've done some bad stuff. Exactly. But and we, we always we always say... We always remind each other as as colleagues, you know, nobody's year, nobody year was arrested while they were in church. Nobody year got arrested for, for picking flowers, you know. Mm. That that's what we say to each other. And and what had happened there was this this inmate was what he, he was sort of manipulated by by someone within his gang, in his camp. I won't say which one. Um they sort of manipulated him to say, Are you willing to do this? No? Okay, then do this. Show us. Show us your worth. Show us who you are. You know, if you if you if you if you are who you say you are, then prove it to us. And a weapon was given to him, a sharpened object was given to him. And when when the cell was was unlocked, um, it was unlocked, he came out and he, he was carrying something in his hand, you know, like it looked like a box of some sort. And we were, we were like, what's this? And he put it down and he just he just went for a senior a senior warden who was standing there. And he, he caught him with the sharpened object, I think, on two spots. Both was on his arm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he actually caught that vein that sort of runs on your bicep. Mm -hmm. he, he, he caught him right on that vein. And, yeah, we, we managed to use the necessary force that, that we had to, had, had to use um, to get the weapon from him as well and to get our colleague out of there. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and tell the viewers that in that moment I was tough and I was big and I was the guy who did this. Because if I'm completely honest with you and the viewers, Josh, 
You know, I felt like a deer caught in headlights when that happened. I really did. A part of me froze in that moment, really. And the, the best that I could do was take out my two-way radio and call for backup. That's the best that I could do in that moment because really it was my, it was my first rodeo, as it were. You know, I, at that point in time, the violence that I'd seen in prison was inmate on inmate. And it was, you know, you'd arrive on the scene after it had taken place. This was the first time that I saw it happen right in front of me. And if I can just give you just a proximity of where my colleague was stabbed, just a few paces in distance between you and, I, you, and you and myself, that was a distance between me and my colleague. And there were other colleagues there present as well. Thank, thank goodness for them because the way they reacted, you know, it obviously wasn't their first radio. You know, for most of my, my career, I've always sort of been the youngest guy there, the, the newest one there for most of my career. But that day I was thankful. I was very thankful and grateful that I was in the presence of people that had had some experience, that had been through this before. And, you know, they were able to do the necessary things. But, yeah, and I told myself that if ever I was in a situation like that, that I would never flee from the danger or get frozen in the danger, but that I would go to that danger with, with my faculties about me and that I would look and, and look for look at people's... Because now, ever since that happened, I'm always looking at people's hands to see, is there something there? Is it being concealed? You know, but yeah, that day I felt, I felt pretty helpless. I'm not going to lie. And um, my colleague is okay. That's um, amazing. We had a medic on on standby who was in the prison at the time, and he he treated him. Um, you know the work that he did. Even the doctors, when that colleague of mine was taken to hospital, said like, you know, that guy really saved you. You would have lost a lot of blood if he didn't do what he did. Um, so my colleague was okay. Um, the inmate was was uh, well, like I said, the necessary force was used on him, and um, yeah, he was removed. And yeah, what what followed in that though? Because I think just to help people understand. When a stabbing happens in prison, it's not as if everything is just okay after that because there's, there's often a lot more tension after that stabbing took place because it seemed as if, I can't say this as fact, but it seemed as if the stabbing was not agreed upon by all three of the camps. Um, it's, it, it seemed as if one camp had acted on, on their own and the others were not consulted. And so there was a bit of tension, a bit of anger, and as a result, a lot of balance had to be brought there. And to make it worse, this was in, in, in the height of sort of lockdown, 2020, May. We were still very, very much in, in lockdown. And as a result, to, to, prevent this, to prevent the sort of spread of COVID and all that kind of things, we were, you know, sort of split down the middle as far as staff is concerned. So half would be at, at work and the other half would not be at work just because of COVID protocols and to minimize that sort of spaces and have people mm -hmm. interacting with each other. So in the wake of that stabbing, it was hectic because we were, we, were, we were a lot fewer than we would have been had it not been locked down and had it not been, been COVID. And when it comes to, say, a prisoner does something like that, right? They act out violently, they murder someone, or they do something that's illegal within the prison, um, especially when it comes to hurting other people. Yeah. Um, are they kept in general population or are they isolated away? So so our, our, our sort of manual dictates to us that that person must be removed because he's a threat to, to people around him. He, he's a threat to them. In the same way that you that have been attacked, you have been now been threatened with violence. So you also need to be removed for your own protection. Um, but when someone does something like that, you know, we would put him in a single cell so that he isn't able to harm any more people and we're able to establish the facts and, and keep him separated, you know, because um, he, he, he needs to be separated. He has to be separated. He can't just be kept now with the general population because, you know, he's shown to us that he's a danger. I know, like, obviously, being an ex-addict, I always mention this on the podcast, but um, <laughs> I know as addicts, right, and mm -hmm. a lot of these gangsters are addicts. Yeah, that's right. Um, you must have seen some funny stuff as well while being there because <laughs> because I know people with when they're especially in a different state of mind or even just people in prison. You know, I'm yeah. sure that people get in like get up to really weird things. Oh yeah. What is the funniest like story that you've you've experienced while working there? I think <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have I've I've told this this story before. Uh it might be there's something I've realized. That humor to us inside prison 
is not humor to people that have never been to prison. Mm. They find it disturbing. You know, they're like, what, what, how, how, and then what happened? I'm like, no, you missed the joke. You know, you, you missed it. They're like, no, but that's not funny. Um, Let's see if I find it funny. <laughs> we, we, we had had a guy, and I've told the story with my friends so many times. We had a guy, uh, without mentioning names and giving specifics, he had obviously used drugs prior to coming to prison. And he was sort of in in a detox, <laughs> as it were. And prison is a tough place to detox. It really is because, you know, you can't, maybe it's a good place because you can't go anywhere. And, you know, you can't really, people will stop you from hurting yourself and everything. But he 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 had been detoxing and we had a spiritual worker um, come in and, and give a lesson. I won't say from which faith, but he, he was sitting there. And so we asked, you know, everybody who who's a, a member of this sort of faith, please come forward. And we know our people. So we know who's having us on and who's just trying to get out. And so, you know, we, we, we put them in a safe space where this religious leader was able to conduct his lesson. But at some point, this one guy who was sort of in the detox and yeah, but uh, he was tripping. Well, not tripping like that. I'm not very good with the drug analogies. I but know what you mean. Yeah, yeah but he, he was, was tweaking he, more. I yeah, think he right, was. But... <laughs> and, and he decided to get up and I think he pretended to be moving his chair or something like that. And he went to go and stand behind this spiritual leader. And while while the spiritual leader was conducting his lesson, completely unaware of what's happening behind him, this guy went and stood behind him and turned his sort of hand into the shape of a gun, <laughs> stand, stand behind him. And the people in front of him obviously realized, hey, well, this guy's busy doing something here. And the spiritual leader turns around and looks. And as he makes eye contact with the guy who's holding his hand in this gun shape, the guy just shouts, bah! <laughs> And obviously this guy was startled. It just, right there, the lesson end, just there. And he says, um, Wardens, I'm done. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, that was awfully quick. And he says, yeah, yeah, I've got I've got my <laughs> en en engagements. And yeah, it's fine. And he goes. And I walk in and I'm like, hey, something happened here. And I ask the other guys, well, what happened? And they said, he he shot him. And I'm like, what do you mean he shot him? And I was like, I said to him, well, how could you do that? And he was like, I thought he was someone else. And I said, but even if he was someone else, you don't just go around shooting people even with if it fingers. is. With your fingers. With your fingers. And I'm not going to lie to you, we didn't see that spiritual worker for a couple of months before he came back. Like, he, And he used to come on a weekly basis. He was traumatized. Do you have any other ones? I'm loving this. Well, not that I can think of right now, but we see funny things all the time. But again, I will say that, you know, what's funny to us might not be funny, funny to, to everyone. Yeah, we, we get a lot of characters in there. And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between who's actually a psych patient and who's actually just someone acting out because mm. of, of you know, narcotics or whatever's in their system. And of course, we need to get both of them help because that's it's very important. Because, you know, people that's, that's, that's sometimes unstable in that aspect, they can often, you know, destroy the balance that we are current, that we work so hard to have within a prison uh, setup. Yeah. In terms of the gangs, do they have a lot of power in the prison? Because that's something that I think everyone has always said is that the numbers gang run the prison. Yeah, I think I, th I would I would put that in sort of that bracket of possibly m that that's also a misconception. That's not to say that they don't have power. That's not to say that, you know, that because we every person has power. You, you and I have power over our own faculties and over our own decisions that we make. But... To the point where, because I think where you're getting at this is that that we take orders from them, and that that's not really what I mean. But I feel like maybe through fear. Oh, and okay, I think I'm with you. You now. know what I'm saying? I'm not saying they go like open that cell. That guy needs to get let out. I'm more of kind of like if you fight with us or push back on us, you will feel the wrath of what you know. We we will we will take action, kind of thing. I almost feel, and with respect, I almost feel like it's the opposite. I almost feel like that's us to them sometimes, because because again, their own their own code always reminds them of respect and discipline, because they themselves understand that for for us to be harmonious and for this to work, there's got to be that balance as well. Of course, they would would try their level best to make sure that you know things that's illegal get to them that, you know, I, my understanding is that prison was a very violent place during those years. But 
just as just as from generation to generation, it almost seems that, and I say this loosely, it's almost as if you know your father's generation is that tough generation. We went to war, we did these things, and then your generation is like the sort of soft generation where we, you know, we're a little bit more in touch with other things. I think that's what has happened in prison. The way I see it is like a lot of the guards come from similar backgrounds yeah, and true. similar areas. Yeah. So is there ever a like? possibility or have, has this ever happened where people have uh, disrespected the gangs or the leaders of the gangs um, and then they have reported to their families or friends outside and they've taken action against the families of the prison guards or the prison guards at their own home? Yeah, I've heard of stories. Maybe not, maybe not so much in terms of, um, you know, threats or violence or that sort of thing. But I've heard a lot of stories of colleagues being approached to smuggle, um, to say, listen, you, you you live in our area. We, you know, we know who you are and you know who we are. And, you know, we can help each other out. You know, we've got some brothers that's inside there. And you know, don't you just want to take some toiletries to them? You know, don't you just want to, because, you know, things are tough and you know, we don't always get the chance to, to see him. So if you could take, you know, this toiletries to him, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. Because nobody comes to you and says, you know, we'd like you to take about a kilogram of weed, mm. and we're gonna we're gonna throw in maybe a hundred tablets of Mandrax as well. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you could help us. You know, no, nobody approaches you like that. You know, th there's got to be a hook first. Um, and I and I and I do understand that sometimes you know living in in areas where you you might be, you know, living in the same street as 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 a, as a, as a gang boss, you know, it it can be very difficult, but. It's it's more so the smuggling aspect. If if you impose a harsh discipline on an inmate who has transgressed, who has stepped out of line, who knows that that he was way out of line when he acted, you know he's he's not gonna gonna try and avenge you and and threaten you and do that sort of thing because again, you know if if you decide to take away his privileges, which is well within your rights, for for him transgressing, you know he's not gonna because obviously. You know, there's a channel where he can say, but I feel like, you know, that's a bit harsh. He'll say, no, I accept it. I, you know, I realize I was wrong and we leave it at that. And tomorrow we greet each other again and we continue. Um, so as far as the threats and the violence goes, yeah, I, I can't I can't say too much on it. But I do know that the difficulty that some of my colleagues face is being approached by, by people outside who live in their area to say, you know, we want you to do this for us. And sometimes if you stand firm, they'll leave you alone. Other times I have, I, ha I do know of colleagues who have been threatened with violence. And as a result, they've had to sort of move homes and, and leave the community where they live in and actually come and live on the prison premises, you know, because the gangs just wouldn't leave them alone. Mm. And I mean, I know there's been a big problem with wardens working with gang members. I've seen quite a few, especially doing research for this, I saw quite a few articles mm. on wardens that have been corrupt and taken bribes mm. or um, dealt with the gangs to smuggle in cell phones and mandrax pills and that kind of stuff. How, do, how, how does that happen? Um, and yeah. how does that dealt with? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite aware of, of what you're talking about. And even right now, there's, a, there's sort of a big who are in the media with a particular gang having sort of allegedly infiltrated, you know, the South African police services. And, you know, there's talk about that. You know, I, I would say that that you know, corruption has probably existed as long as people have existed, mm. um, and I think uh, you could be approached and asked to do something, and you could easily say no and leave it at that. But I think what happens is sometimes people have certain lifestyles to support. They have, you know, certain things that, um, that, yeah, maybe the rest of us, you know, we we are able to resist that sort of. To me, it's not temptation, because you know the the last place I want to be is in the pocket of, of an inmate. The last place I want to be is in the pocket of a drug merchant, or someone who wants me to to, to risk my life. You don't want to owe them anything. Not at all. But it's easy for me to say that, because. I had a fairly privileged upbringing in Simonstown, sheltered Simonstown, you know, where I I only became aware of of gangs at a much later age, 
You know, I only became aware of this. For someone who grows up in that street, um, in that community, I can imagine it's a lot more difficult. But that doesn't excuse because, because you know, to be a, a carrier for for the gangs, you know, there's no honor in that. What is like the most contraband you found in, in someone's ass? <laughs> Um, I know well, you probably well, don't do the searches. Yeah, but. no. So we don't do the searches, but when when we search and we find things, it's already been there. You, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's already come out. So you you find so often, you find it afterwards. You find it afterwards, okay. and, and maybe some is already missing. You know, maybe some has already been smoked. Um, so, but what the most is, I, I I couldn't say. But what I will say is that people have been apprehended before it's already come in. And and sometimes, you know, I think the most, the most that that I think I was called, because I again I you know I used to sort of do a little bit of camera work for the department as well. I think something in the region of 140 Mandrax tablets, about 1.5 kilograms of weed uh, of weed. And yeah, of course there was some crystal meth as well. But that was apprehended long before it actually entered into the mm. into the prison. Yeah. And when it comes to weapons in prison, um what do they make them out of? Anything. Literally, literally anything. Anything that can be sharpened, a spoon, sharpen in the you know, the end of a spoon, just make it sharper, that becomes a knife. Um, you know, if there is a padlock that, you know, they're able to intercept and find that could be a weapon. Almost anything could be a weapon. I saw a broomstick. In the documentary well. with the Ross Kemp one yeah. again. Uh, where they the guy took padlocks yeah. and they put them on like on, a on little a belt, rope yeah. or like a belt yeah. and they would hold it very close to hand and that looks like the most dangerous weapon. Yeah. That looks like knuckle dusters on steroids. <laughs> I would fear for my life if someone came after me with that. Yeah, I, I've never seen a lock being used in an attack, but I'm aware that anything can be used as a weapon. Yeah. There, there, there are no limits you know, to what is a weapon and what and what isn't a weapon. What's the most creative thing you've seen or heard of being made in prison? Creative? Well, that's a difficult one. Something that you looked at and you're like, wow, that's new. We've got a female prison. Maybe I, maybe this falls into the, the category of, of the funniest thing I've seen in prison. Um, we've got a female prison and they took a big sort of um, block of green soap you know the kind of i think south africans will know what i'm talking about it's the kind of green soap that people use to sort of wash washing by hand i know it's it's sort of green about, yeah. sunlight soap but the way it comes in in prison is that it's one very long block you know it's, it's i think it's about half a meter Jeez. and and what had happened at the female prison is they had taken this 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 block and i don't know if they melted it in the sun or what they did with hot water or something but they had sort of shaped it into what I could only assume was their take on a dildo. <laughs> and and they had put some, you know, condoms over it and I th I'll, I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. Was it one dildo or many dildos? No, it, it was one. <laughs> is, is, that, is that the plural for... for <laughs> cluster of dildos. Yeah, for dildai, yeah. <laughs> no, it was one. It was one. It was one. And the thing is, that's um, a big one, eh? Yeah. So uh, that had happened when I worked in PR, oh when I was working word. in the PR office, and I, 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 I came to the female prison because they were having some event. They'd asked me to be there, and I stopped over at the investigations office within the prison, and I greeted a colleague of mine who works there as investigator, and that was there, and I was like, "What's this?" And then he explained it to me, and I was like, "Wow, wow, wow, wow." Um, yeah, that was. <laughs> Yeah, is it for pain? Is it for pleasure? I don't that know. That is interesting. Maybe both. And um, in terms of the, the woman's prison, is which one do you think is more ruthless? Because I think it's no one really speaks about the women's prisons. But I, I'm pretty sure is it, I'm sure it's not sun, sunshine and roses as well. No, not at all. Um, which one do you think has the most incidents between the men and the women's prison? I would say it's the men. I think that's easy to say. Just And I think it's simply because the amount of male inmates at Paulsmore far outweighs the amount of mm. female inmates at Paulsmore. So in terms of incidents, there's always going to be more amongst the males. Yeah. But that's that's not to say that, that things are all easy at the female prison because while the number gang doesn't exist at the female prison, there are females incarcerated that work for gangs that are, they would see themselves as gangsters. Um, 
the gangs that they would work for are sort of outside gangs. And, you know, I won't mention any names because I don't want anyone to think that I'm slandering yeah, one course. particular gang. But but every it, the, 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 reason, the reason why I say every gang has females that works for it is because gangsters have girlfriends. You know, gangsters have girlfriends. And when you are the the girlfriend of a gangster, you are a gangster. You're an extension of the gang yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, often, often, you know, the woman will be the ones. I've I've heard some stories when I when I've engaged with some inmates and asking them, hey, your your other gang brother was here. How's he doing? You know, is he still alive? We we say that loosely because a lot of the time the answer is no, he, he was shot, he was killed, he passed away. And 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 I asked him, so what happened there? And he says, you won't believe it, sir, but a girl actually lured him in and she was working for another gang and that's how they killed him. You know, he fell for this girl, she got him to a place and, and you know, so there are female gangsters, but at, in particular at the female prison, it's split into two between masculine and feminine. And so we call them, and I'll explain to the international guests, we call them, we call them brookies and skirties, which in Afrikaans means trousers, and the other one means a skirt. Mm-hmm. And so in, in a female prison, if you see someone, you say, oh, she's a brookie, it means she leans more towards the masculine side. Okay. And the opposite, obviously, as well. Yeah. And yeah, there, there are incidents that take place there as well. And when it comes to like rehabilitation programs in Polsmore, um, I've seen videos online of some of the rehabilitation programs, and I know... Turner Adams, who was also on my podcast, yeah, was yeah. in one of those programs. Yeah. Do you think that those um, programs really have a good effect on them or do you think that it doesn't really make much of a difference? A lot of those programs is, is very effective. And there are, there's some footage of stuff that was done you know, way back, I think, in the early 2000s with the most hardened criminals um, that were housed at the, at the remand detention maximum at Paulsmore but stay in the role of the victim. You, you put my penis to inside of my China without my penis in, and what I'm going to do now, I'm going to tell my parents what you did to me. Ah, come on, man, what are you making a big issue of it? You, you are waiting that I must be drunk so that you can force me to do this. Come on, Mavis, I didn't force you. You forced the issue and we just went to it. Mad as had to the other. We were so hyped up and spiked up that we went with the full aggression to each other. And you never cried, you never shouted, you did nothing. I did shout and you hold me there by my throne so I couldn't speak loud and shouting to for help. You will be arrested for this. But I'm telling you now, you call your parents and you'll see what happens to you okay. and your parents. I think where, where people get it horribly wrong is with that early childhood development phase and and a, a, a child that doesn't grow up having that foundation you know will be raised by the gangs will be raised by you know will ultimately and i don't like to say this but it's the reality you, you you tend to become a product of society if nobody gives you that sort of foundation that's mm-hmm. so necessary and coming to the rehabilitation it's like you've got to now there's already a wall that's been built but the foundations on which that wall's been built it's crumbling and it's brought them there in the first place. Mm. And so you've really got to just go back all the way to the beginning. And that's something that I learned from, from Mr. Malchus. You know, he used to he used to be responsible for the youngest prisoners or the youngest inmates. And and I'll share this story as well, uh, you know, just after I share this one. Um, these are boys that just turned 18. And I walked in one day in one of his classes that he was doing and these boys, boys with tattoos on their face and tattoos all over their body who are 18 years old who had already come from these sort of places of safety or sort of what previously was known as Bonnie Town and then became this sort of new horizon you know these these places of safety because they're too young to come to prison he was busy with these boys and if you look at their charge sheets almost all of them are there for multiple murders you know and they're 18 years old and they were sitting there and he was doing a lesson with them. And some of them were sitting with gold stars on their forehead. And that was for participation. Because they participated and shared, there's a gold star for you. And when I asked him about this, he said to me, we've got to take them back. He says, when you, did, the so- when you did something, when you did something good 
at school when you did something well in grade one or grade two, whatever, your teacher rewarded you with a gold star. You were proud to walk with that gold star because it meant something and everybody else knew what that gold star meant. He said most of these boys have missed out. They never got their gold star because they never went. You know, they became gangsters. They, they, they were the ones carrying the drugs for the gang. So we've got to take them back and we've got to give them that gold star because – We've got to get them on that on that journey. That's We've got to amazing. get them on that path. Yeah. And the story that I wanted to share, and this was probably, I always wondered how you would go about rehabilitating people yeah. that have gone down such a such a path like that. You know, you've got to um, go back to the beginning. Which that is incredible way to go about it. It is. You just start from the foundation. Yeah. You can't build on a bad foundation. You you can't. And the the story that I wanted to share, and it it it, it made me incredibly sad. Um, I was asked to to work late and I was asked to be a part of the searching squad of the people that's returning from court. And so the last courts get in at about six in the evening and those are sort of the furthest courts away. And the supervisor sort of came to me and said, well, everybody's in, we're just waiting for, and then he, I think it was like a, a court much for, further away. And the, the police truck pulled up, young guy gets out, only one inmate and it was his 18th birthday on the day he came to prison. And what had happened was he was in prison. He, w he was in that sort of place of safety that I mentioned where the court sends you because you're too young to go to prison. And he came from that place of safety because he had turned 18, he was not old enough to come to prison. And so he rocks up there on his 18th birthday, having slept the night before in a place of safety um, for, for people that commit crime. He gets there, now I've got to search him. And so I ask him to put his bags down and now he has to get, you know, take his clothes off because I've got to visually inspect his naked body. Mm. And as I'm going through his things, there was a birthday card amongst his, his his things that he had. And it was a birthday card from his mom to him. And it was in Afrikaans. And I, I obviously, I, I read the card. And I just remember feeling just a profound sense of sadness come over me because I thought back to my 18th birthday. And for most of us as South Africans, you know, you turn 18 as a, as a, you know, maybe your dad takes you out for your first legal beer or you go out with your friends mm -hmm. because there's this perception of, well, we're legal now. We've got, you've got an ID document. You can do certain things at your 18th birthday. This kid on his 18th birthday came to prison and his mom had written him a birthday card and started off by saying, you know, my son, I love you very much. I know that this is not where God has intended you to be but it is where you are. I'm your mom. I'll always love you. I'll always support you. I want you to be honest, to tell the truth so that your life can begin and that you can serve your time and then you and I can be mother and son together when you come out of prison. And I was just, I was just overcome with sadness. And I said to him, you understand what your mother's saying to you in this letter? And he said, yes, chief, I understand. And I said, I hope that you'll listen to your mother's words and that you will enjoy your life with your mother. And I told him, you have a lot of life left in you. Be honest, do what needs to be done, and then go and live your life with your mom. You know, not having to look over your shoulder, not having to be guilty, not, you know, and as he walked away, I just thought, I hope he understands. I hope he gets it. You know, I really, I never saw him again. Um, but yeah, that was just one of the, the sad days because, you know, somebody once said that if, if, there was an American sort of missionary talking to kids on the Cape Flats. And she asked him, you know, what will you become one day? What do you want to become? And he says, his words to her was, I'll either become, you know, a Christian missionary or pastor or I'll become a gangster. It depends who gets to me first. And this is the story that she told. And we've got a, a you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. You know, we've got so much work that needs to be done. And it's not just the responsibility of one organization or one group of people because by the time you come to me you know we've already failed you the community out there the people around you that's supposed to care for you supposed to love you supposed to protect you you know you've already been failed mm -hmm. and now you come to me and prison is a reflection of society nobody comes to society is not a reflection of prison you know people get sent to prison because of things they did outside so I often think like sometimes, yeah, sometimes outside is not that good either. You know, it's difficult out there. And if we don't begin at the beginning with the foundations and get the necessary role players involved, 
my doors are going to have to be open and my rooms are going to be full because mm. more and more young people are going to be coming to prison. And that's the sad reality. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming down and chatting with me today. It's thank been you. really cool to hear your experience. And uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone found this very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Josh, for having me. And I hope that, um, yeah, as people listen to this, that the perception will change somewhat of prison. Um, and then we'll all be mindful that, you know, we all have a role to play as well, mm. to some extent. 100%. But thank you for having me. It's been it's been great. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for watching. I never say this, but if you got to this the end of the podcast, like and subscribe. <laughs> I never say that, but I'm going to start. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. Because everyone watches, but no one subscribes. Oh, you got to like and subscribe. <laughs> you got to. So, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you all very soon. Cheers.